I was, it was random because I was talking to Mike about when we did our talk and he was going over the knee and he said that he loves the knee. And one of my online interns sent me a video, ironically, of where I used to teach at MPTI. And this teacher who I knew, he posted a video of the curtsy lunge and basically said it was the worst fucking thing ever. Like if you're doing it, it's the sheer forces, the mechanical forces, and he's sounded all intelligent and just really saying this is really, really bad for you. And so I, I talked to Mike about it, and he was like, oh, that's fine. And that's what I so – I, I don't really like going to extremes. I'm kind of like a U-shaped curve right in the middle. I don't like saying this is really terrible. I can even say, like, a burpee's fine if you're – it's like, whatever. I mean, I like making fun of bench tips because I just think they're stupid. But, like, <laughs> this guy was being pretty harsh on it. And so then I, I posted some stuff, and I'm trying to get more engagement with our Instagram. And there was, like, four or five people that really were offended, and they were just like – I can't believe there's idiots like you that are talking about this. And this is, this is so disrespectful to the, the industry as a whole. And then I go into this guy's, you know, stock him a little bit and he's doing a fucking lateral raise on a stability ball bouncing on his knees. And I'm like, there we go. This is, this is that. Amazing. That's what you need. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's so much out there. I mean, you guys have a ton of followers. And so how do you guys handle the, the it's not like pushback, but I'm sure you get a lot of people critique, critiquing or saying that. Yeah. All right. How do you guys do that? Yeah. Well, for for us, we we don't feed into that much. So if we do see some comments that are, people are always going to have their own opinions. Obviously, the the more people see it, the more likely people are to bash it, especially with comments. Now, if you post a story, it's less likely to get bashed because people are not feeding into each other's uh, biases. But we just don't really feed into it. And to be honest, we try to take a very non one-sided approach either kind of like kind of like you unless we feel like something is is strongly not beneficial um and there are actually i take that back there are times where we're pretty strongly opinionated on a specific topic but in terms of exercises it's tough because there there really is no it's hard to say this is the wrong exercise unless it's not meeting the intent of the exercise that you're prescribing it for so mm -hmm. that's that's the difficult part of exercising but like things like uh the narrative behind why someone gets their neck cracked or what ultrasound is really doing or things like that are things we'll take a little stronger side uh stronger opinion on or even like foam rolling the it band um those will take a little stronger opinion uh but usually we'll with exercise we try to just say what stick to what we know and don't push what we think mm -hmm. we know but um but yeah we don't we don't feed into it much i'm sure i'm sure everyone gets some of that you guys i'm sure do too uh, from yeah, time it's, to time. I, it's 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 like a slippery slope because i feel like trainers first off the foundation sucks they're not very knowledgeable they come in they they get a certification and they take another certification and they start going down these crazy rabbit holes whether if it's pri or some dns stuff which has some merit behind it maybe but then it's like it's there it's maybe a little too much and i don't know if you got a chance do you follow ben bruno at all yeah i know yeah. ben bruno and ben's a great guy he was doing a, a trap bar squat or a trap bar deadlift with uh, myers you know his basketball player mm. and it just exploded into this huge fight i don't know if you saw it so then the, ben and this other guy they got onto an instagram live and they had this debate and this guy, he has like 300,000 followers. He's a strength coach for a bunch of professional athletes. And the whole entire debate that he was going off was, was basically Ben's a fucking idiot because he doesn't do a screen with a goniometer with every single one of his clients. And he's going off and he was just, he was trying to be polite. It was actually pretty, like the way they were engaging, it wasn't like really contentious but he was on his high horse basically saying like if you don't know that a client can get to 135 degrees of knee flexion with a the goniometer then i just can't believe that there's professionals out there i'm just like holy shit like that's i mean you're you have a that's, dpt and do you even you do you use a goniometer do you or do you not i i do i mean i do sometimes but that that's a bit extreme i don't take it i don't take it unless it's like if it's someone post operatively or i'm specifically trying to improve range of motion then I'll make sure I measure. Uh, but if I'm more focused on the performance aspect of things and, and I'm just having someone go into a squat, I don't check all the ranges of motion to see. I look global. You always, like, even when you assess a movement, uh, 
ever ever since I learned in PT school and all these different SFMA, FMS movements, you look global first. Mm -hmm. And then even when I'm running analysis, I look global. And then if I see something fishy, I'll start breaking out the movement and look, look local. It's not yes. like I'm going to break out every single joint, make sure every joint moves and has adequate range of motion before I prescribe a, an exercise. Yeah, that's great. I totally understand. Like you're, you're post-op a couple months and you still have the bandages and stuff on there. Yeah, sure. Maybe you take out the goniometer and that's like in that specific environment, but he has his own certification class and everything. And it's, and then he was doing a, a squat variation and I knew some of the people that were getting in and I just like sitting back and eating my popcorn and watching. And he was saying like, he's like, when you do a squat, you got to do it like this mechanically so that you turn off the quads. And, and these people are getting so frustrated, like you're doing a squat pattern, then the knee is extending there. You can't shut off a muscle. And but this person like really believes that they're right. So I tell students, be cautious because you're going to be having an argument with someone who believes that one plus one is 13. And then they're going to get a bunch of their followers and basically say that, oh, look at this guy over here. They think it's two. You're a fucking idiot. And you can get really heated and be like, what the hell? Like, am I an idiot? I have to kind of fact check some of the basics. And so... I, that was uh, an interesting little thing, and it kind of feeds into what I wanted to talk about today with the with Jonda and the the syndromes of uh, upper cross, you know, yeah. anterior pelvic tilt, lower cross, and then pronation distortion syndrome. And just kind of get you guys' take on it. And there's the whole entire NASM CPT, the sixth edition, it's all off of upper cross, lower cross, and pronation distortion syndrome. Really yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So Yonda approach, basically it's, it's a philosophy and a method more than it is a style of treatment. And with the Yonda approach, the idea is that there's muscles that are like tonic, meaning they're prone to being stiff and phasic muscles that are prone to being lengthened or weakened. And the idea is that your body is prone to being in certain imbalances um, based on muscles that are tonic versus muscles that are phasic. Now, he's kind of broken it down into the upper cross and lower cross syndrome that, that you were talking about, which are common presentations with that rounded posture that a lot of people have when they sit or that excessive anterior pelvic tilt lumbar extension that a lot of people have. So these are positions that are easily classified in lo as lower cross and upper cross syndrome. Now, the reason why a lot of clinicians don't like using those terms, first of all, the syndrome is just a host of signs and symptoms it's not a specific diagnosis or a specific uh pattern it's just an umbrella term so uh people don't like using lower cross and upper cross syndrome because there is no evidence to back up that there is uh first of all that there's a problem or if there's a risk factor with someone having that position and that person being at risk for future injuries so there's no evidence really to to back that up uh and then the other thing is Actually, sorry, I don't want to say there's no evidence. There's poor evidence to back that up because there are, there are some studies to show that, yeah, if you're, if you're rounded, you're at risk of potentially having some shoulder impingement. But um, there's not much evidence for that, and especially with the lower body, there's even less evidence for, for that. And it's hard to prove that a specific posture, especially static posture, is, is a problem. Uh, posture is a dynamic thing, and when you just focus on someone's static position, you're kind of missing the boat and not really seeing the whole picture. How someone moves is far, far more important than someone's static positioning itself. And sometimes the static positioning could just be structural where the bones are just in those position. Like someone just has excessive kyphosis and, and their, their thoracic spine is just a little more flexed. You're not going to potentially be able to change that if it truly is structural. So there, there's a lot of clinicians out there that, that bash it and, at first, I used, to, I used to love using his terminology when I was a, a brand new clinician, even in PT school. I loved using the terminology that, that uh, Yonda talked about. And, and actually, Yonda didn't write the Yonda approach. It's just three um, therapists that were under um, Yonda that, that created that text. But I've kind of steered a little bit away from it. And uh, I still like some of the ideas, and it's an easy way to talk about someone's presentation however it's not necessarily as evidence-based as a lot of the therapists want which is why people bash it so it's hard to say whether it's right or wrong it is still a way of saying this is this is their presentation and we can easily work and you know it, it there 
I think there is some truth behind it. Like if most people strengthened their mid lower trap rhomboids, um, stretched out their pec, worked on their deep neck flexors, stretch out their suboccipitals. I think in general, most people would probably benefit from that. Um, and same thing with the lower body. If people worked on their glutes and anterior core, maybe stretch their hip flexors and erectors, I'm, I'm sure most people will benefit from that. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't benefit from the opposite either. In general, my philosophy is, is more so uh, strengthen than, than stretch the, the stiff spot. So it's like, it's all about a, a, a pulley system. And so if someone does have this excessive anterior pelvic tilt, then I'd rather focus on strengthening the glutes than focus on just stretching the, the hip flexors for hours on end. Or maybe if I do stretch, it's just specifically for a little bit of reciprocal inhibition just to allow for the glutes to fire a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, I use the analogy. I like to look at it when I always like saying this stuff because it's good for you guys to correct me if I'm wrong. And so it's like you have a joint and you have, you know, an anterior, posterior, medial, lateral aspects. So if we're taking a look at the hip, it's like a rowing team. It's you and I and the other prehab guys, and we're a world-class team. And all of a sudden I decide to uh, get blacked out, drunk, and go to jail, and now I'm off the team. And you three have to pick up my slack where mm -hmm. you guys aren't necessarily – you're going to be doing more work and with that analogy, maybe if you guys were stronger, it could help a little bit. So like looking at the hip where a lot of times we get this anterior hip pain where NASA going to say you got to foam roll for 20 to 40 seconds and you got to static stretch for 20 to 40 seconds and you got to activate for, you know, a 4 2 one tempo on the posterior side, which, yeah, maybe there is some merit to, but maybe we can get there a little faster by looking at the whole joint and strengthening the anterior, maybe even the, the medial as well because the adductors are – a muscle group that are really powerful, but we don't do a lot of frontal plane exercises to strengthen them concentrically. The same with the lateral hip muscles, the, you know, the glute med and the, the glute max and the upper fibers. So maybe we should take a more of a global holistic approach and not just single out and say that, oh, you know, Rosh is the top rower. He, it's his fault. It's, you know, everyone's uh, can, c contribution. And would you, would you say there's something to that or Oh, I 110% I agree with that. It, and that's, that's the problem with a lot of these approaches is that people get too focused on the nitty gritty and they lose track of the entire picture and everything exactly like you said works together. And you, you, you can't even use the term isolate because you're really just biasing. You can never shut the opposite thing or other antagonist muscles off. If I do hip extension, I'm going to have to use my glutes and hamstring both. It's not like I can just say, hey, I'm only going to be using my glutes here, even though I can bias it a little bit more. So I really like that, that approach. And um, something else, too, that, that they talk about, and I don't know if you know Shirley Sarman, but she has a lot of, she has a lot of stuff that's along the same lines. Is She's from, uh, uh, is, it, is it Chicago or she's from which uh... – Washington. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I remember she's a little newer, whereas John does it in the 20s, is it? Or? Yeah, um, I, I think it was, I think that's probably when he started, maybe uh, into okay. the 60s. Okay. Uh, I, honestly, I, I, don't, I don't remember. Uh, I, did do a, I did do a project uh, on the Yonda approach in PT school. I should know this, but... Um, <laughs> But basically, but it's, it's old school versus more, or Simon's more today. And, and so what were you saying? Sorry to cut you off. So, so it's this, but the thing is, even though it's newer school, it's newer school around the same idea of being very focused on the, the specifics to the point where, um, and not saying that there's anything wrong with it. And I, I like a lot of what Sarman says, but it's, it's very specific with like things like focus on PICR where you're just rotating purely at the shoulder and, and not moving in any other plane. It's very isolated movements. And it's, if you take corrective exercises on steroids is basically what you get with um, when, you, when you look at these. And for, for us, we typically have found that just jumping into global exercises for, for most people, at least the population we've worked with, end up doing fine, where we kind of, we, we don't put too much stock there. So if someone does have, I don't know, poor control of their posterior cuff, we kind of just load up the posterior cuff with shoulder external rotation exercises and don't focus so much on, on just focusing on pure rotation 
without moving in, in any other plane of movement. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it is kind of going off of these, these specific movement patterns. But uh, for us, if we were to say which side of the pendulum we, sw- we swing more on, it's more of what you were referring to with um, focusing on, on big picture, what's going on. And so if I were to run through, they have this NASA has a big thing on these muscles that you need to memorize. And I think that it, it, it's, I bash it because it's just fun to do, but then I do come full circle. I'll come back and you know, I do think there is a, a purpose to understand maybe that some of these muscles may need some more work. So they're going to talk about the main overactive muscles would be like your gastrocnemius, soleus, maybe your lateral vastus, your, your psoas, your lats, your upper traps. Um, those are the main adductors they're going to address. And then the weak ones will be maybe your anterior tib, your, your core, mid-lower traps, deep cervical flexors. And there's a couple of things I want to address with that. One being, the, they call it the VMO, um, NASM does. And I've talked to some other people, and <laughs> this was a therapist like six years ago, and she's like, oh, I didn't know people still use that. So when they say, you know, for those that vastus medialis oblique muscle, the idea behind that is, the lateralis is pulling on the tendon maybe, patellar track and stuff. And what is the current evidence behind that approach? Yeah, good, good. That's, that's a good point. So uh, there right now is no evidence to show that you can isolate the VMO specifically. So the idea previously, like looking at, um, I don't know, maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, people would focus on VMO, VMO, VMO to try to, like you're saying, bring the patella a little more medial because when people have lateral uh, knee pain, they would assume that the lateral quad muscles are pulling the, the patella more laterally. However, we realize now that we can't isolate the VMO as much as people previously thought. So you just focus on quad strength in general, and then if you can control the hips a little bit better, that may allow for better patella tracking overall than focusing on this VMO isolation, which, which was historically what a lot of people thought was was uh the way to approach patella maltracking issues however not not really good evidence there and Mm -hmm. focusing on on glute control slash quad strength in general is the consensus so you know talking about going above the joint below proximal distal a lot of times when there is a, a situation and again this is just to reiterate for those students that are watching we're not telling you guys to practice in the capacity by any means this is you have a client who comes in and we don't need to scare the shit out of them by saying, oh, your VMO is weak. Because then that's where they're like, oh, shit, they're going to put a guard up and they're going to be probably a little hesitant to move properly. So I like to kind of let everyone know that like when I take someone through a workout and I show them how to squat, and this is fucking terrible, I don't say that was a fucking terrible squat. I'm like, yeah, that was a good shot. Here's what we need. Let's try to improve it by this way. Maybe draw them back more. And so I try to encourage their movement because at least they're trying. And so I, I've, I've seen trainers that will do the FMS and they'll – They'll test them out, and then they'll just have their clipboard, and they'll basically just start saying that, oh, you're screwed. You're going to die. Your shoulder's going to fall <laughs> off. And But there are some muscles that maybe we can pay a little more attention. And I, I was fascinating when you were fixing my broken-ass body, and you were, you were telling me about the, the ability of the upper traps to kind of fire maybe a little quicker than other ones around the shoulder joint. Could you talk to us a little bit more about the upper traps and what we were talking about? Yeah. Well, well, so in, in general, I, I want to preface this by saying just because you feel a muscle or your client feels a muscle is stiff or tight doesn't mean that it's overactive and, and it's being the, uh, the way that Yonda would break it up is, is tonic. It doesn't mean that necessarily. Like there are certain muscles, uh, even post-operatively, you'll see that will, will spasm up or tighten up because the body's trying to protect itself. So your body is always taking inventory of where it feels stable and where it doesn't. And so if there's a body part that doesn't feel strong and stable, your body will realize that and end up sending some signaling to, to try to protect it by having the muscles tighten up a little bit. So I just wanted to say, just because sometimes there, there are people that try to stretch their pain away or stretch their stiffness away, and they actually sometimes make it worse. So it doesn't mean stretch. Even, even so, um, like for example, the hamstrings are, are an easy example. Just because you feel your hamstrings being pulled on doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's tight either. It can be lengthened in, in being pulled on just because you're very much so in this potentially anterior pelvic tilted position. So anyways, going back to what, what you brought up with the upper trap, um, 
for you, let's say uh, scapula is a little more depressed um, than, than most people. Uh, a little bit of this TOS type stuff going on in your arm. So for, for you, actually upper trap strengthening would be beneficial um, from, from last time when we did that assessment. Because if you raise your scapula a little bit, you can offload a lot of those neurovascular structures that, that go into that, um, those, those regions. So it, if you just increase the tone a bit, you will end up shortening the muscle. So it may not be stretching a lot of those suprascapular tissues being the, the, all the neurovascular structures that go in through there. So that's when we talked about just activating and strengthening the upper trap. Now I would say in general, most people probably overuse their upper trap, just making a generalization here. But uh, for, for you, I wouldn't mind necessarily a little more upper mm -hmm. trap strengthening. So I'm, I'm the like the bubble boy. I went into Arash, probably, I don't know, I haven't even been close to a year ago, maybe. And uh, he, mm -hmm. gave, he checked me out and said that TOS, thoracic outlet syndrome, and I would get numbness down my pinky and my middle finger or my ring finger. I mean, I, I was starting to you know, do a bunch of shrugs and I haven't had that problem in probably about three months now. So that's, it's just consistent. Oh, nice. It's, it's one of those things that it's, it's it works. <laughs> it, ta it takes a long time, though. I'm glad you stuck with it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'm, there's always on to the next project. But So I, I use this analogy in class. I want to see if I'm, I was on the, the right mark with it when you're talking about the, the nervous system maybe being a little more protective. And I call it the roly-poly effect. And so, you know, like a roly-poly, we're a bunch of fucking weirdos up in Northern California. You have a bunch of those little bugs. And if you, if you touch them, they, you know, they roll up like that. You familiar with roly-polies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And so mm. you, you get a lot of the stereotypical you know, tightness on the anterior hip. Maybe it's the lats. Maybe it's the nervous system's way of protecting itself from other muscles that are weak. Or maybe that muscle could even be weak. And so, you know, looking at the, the muscle and the joint in all aspects. And that's why if you know your anatomy, we don't want to just say, oh, it's this muscle, foam roll stretch, and we're good to go. Well, let's, let's see how that person moves. Let's look at the a squat, a hands, unilateral push-pull. You can do some screens. Let's see how they move and then also kind of just be aware of their physiological symptoms if they're a little hesitant for something. I work with a girl who, who deadlifted in the CrossFit and she blew it out. I don't know, blew it out, whatever terminology you want to use, but she had to have an ambulance come and take her to the hospital on three different occasions. And she blamed it strictly on deadlifting. And when I was working with her, she was on the verge of tears. And I said, 100% you are not going to hurt yourself when you do this because I'm teaching you the right way. And what I did is I just gave her soothing words and I could see her guard really come down and she was able to do that pattern. Whereas you put yourself in that like masculine environment, CrossFit, go, 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 nothing wrong with CrossFit, but they're pushing her and she's, she's freaked out and her body's probably real protective and it's not going to allow for optimal movement. And it was just kind of a relapse. And so is there some Maybe merit to what I'm saying with the roly-poly effect. It's not going to be in a physical therapy book anytime soon, but <laughs> that makes sense. No, that's ex that's exactly just you just put a term on the idea that I was talking about, which I love the roly-poly effect. I mean, even even times post-operatively, like you're saying, we'll see this. They're we know they're weak. They haven't used their muscle for a few weeks, but it's stiff. And why why is it stiff? It's not like it's overused. We haven't really used it. It's completely atrophied. It's just the body trying to guard itself however it can. You'll do a muscle test and realize that muscle has no strength. It's, it's just that, that tonicity of the muscle that, that is really that roly-poly effect, which you're talking about, trying to hold on and stabilize the, that joint however it can. Well, and I always appreciate your guys' time, and I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about upper cross, lower cross. And so for you NASM heads, we're not making fun of you. It's just that material may be a little outdated. There is some legitimacy to maybe some certain muscles that need to be worked on but i think you'll do a lot better off if you focus on your anatomy understanding movement the patterns the basic stuff and be able to take those next step of looking more globally is there anything else that you want to add when it comes to those syndromes or anything or um yeah no i completely agree with what you said uh the even like foam rolling certain areas like you got to be careful with that anterior hip region too i've seen people jam lacrosse balls in their anterior hip region and there's there's some neurovascular structures that go right in there you got to be careful same thing with like um the shoulder as well uh there's people that just jam lacrosse balls in there you got to know your anatomy like you mentioned and there there are structures that you have to be careful of 
And that's why if your goal is really to improve mobility, there's got to be some type of assessment, reassessment um, that goes behind it or, or you're kind of just guessing with, with that. Uh, but at the end of the day, you got to be specific with each person that's in front of you. And uh, that's, that's the reality of it. Just to piggyback off what you're saying, I know a lot of, it's, it's tough because I don't, you don't want to call people out because it's not in my capacity, but there's, you know, doctors and physical therapy out there that will be doing a uh, first rib mobilization. They're teaching people how to do that with like deep stuff in there. I'm like, that's your ballpark. That's fine. But average trainer with a corrective exercise cert, don't even think about train, playing around with that. Like, there's a lot more to it than, you know, putting a, a dowel deep into your neck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you're hundred percent right. And it's the cost benefit uh, analysis where is, is that even worth Like sometimes with that stuff, even though I think someone can benefit from it, I may not even have someone do it at home just because there's so much stuff in there. And if they're off of that first rib and jamming the nerves or jamming uh, these arteries that go through there, they, they can end up in a bad spot. Well, make sure you guys check out their uh, their site and also that you guys' app is all uh, up and going. That's pretty awesome stuff. It's also, it's not just for therapists, it's for trainers too. And if you yeah. just tell them a little bit more about that, so if people wanted to grab that. Yeah, so we have the exercise library, which is for really anyone looking to learn more about specific exercise movements broken down by body part, uh, diagnoses, uh, muscles, um, so many hundreds of tags that we have on there. You can create programs, send out programs that are individualized. We also have programs on our app, which is Prehab, and you can find programs in which we have created um, where we got all the parameters in there and there's actual structure versus the exercise library is more of a database for you to just look up and send to potential clients of yours. You might recognize some of the background imagery in some of those videos too. Yeah, all of those videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, again, I appreciate Powered by show up. <laughs>